Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, John, and the orchestra and the choir. Beautiful job. Can we give it up for them one more time? Grace to you, beloved congregation. As we gather in the spirit of Advent, in this season of waiting and anticipating, I promise I won't be up here for long. Today's theme is talking about this kind of mushy, gushy love. Matter of fact, I believe that love has been tossed around willy-nilly as so it doesn't have any weight. I believe that love, in the way that we understand it today, has lost its meaning. Just like many other words in English, the word for love has multiple meanings in Greek. And I will hope that as we define these, that we can become clearer on what it means to love. So I'm gonna need a little bit of crowd participation. Because we're gonna talk about four different types of love. Now, if you've heard this before, join in. You should be the loudest. And if this is new to you, it's okay. We will hold your hand. See, there is this love called philios. Everybody say philios. philios. It's the brotherly love. It's warm and tender. It's platonic between friends. It's where we get words like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, or philanthropy, the, the act of loving one another. And then there's eros. Everybody say eros. eros. It's the exotic romantic love, the emotion towards one another, the type of love that a husband would have for his wife and his wife for the husband. And then there's storge. Everybody say storge. It involves empathy, ca compassion, providing comfort. It's the love that you share to one another when a loved one has passed. And then there's agape. Everybody say agape. agape. Now, my systematic the theology teacher, Dr. Donald Brash, would say it's agape. But we'll let you go now. It's agape. Agape is this selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love felt on a spiritual level. You cannot earn it. You don't deserve it. It is just given. So hopefully through these definitions, you one, have become a Greek scholar, congratulations, and two, you come to understand what love means and know that the love that came with Jesus Christ, we cannot compare. We cannot live up, and yet we strive to. My prayer for you this morning my prayer for you this morning is that we're filled with not only the emotional love that motivates us, but a love that we choose to show compassion, selflessness towards one another. Love, hopefully, you will come to see is a choice today and every day that we must choose. We must put on the attributes of selfless love. We must put on the attributes of agape or agape love because it was shown to us by Jesus. In the heart of Christmas, in the heart of Christmas narrative, within Matthew, which we're having our passage today, so if you have your Bibles, which you should, and if you don't, there's a black one around you somewhere. You may have to hop a pew, it's okay. We're going to be in Matthew 1, 18 to 25. And you have heard throughout this season a lot of the story from the perspective of Mary. And I want to submit to you this morning the perspective of Joseph. It reads this. Matthew 1, 18, 25. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came to be about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to the public, in public disgrace, 
he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But they did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave them the name Jesus. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we delve into your word, open up our hearts to understand the depths and the breadth of your love shown in the birth of Jesus Christ. Guide us in reflecting on the choices of love made in this story and help us to apply these lessons in our own life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. In this passage, we encounter Joseph, a man faced with, significant, with a significant decision. His betrothed, Mary, is found to be with child, and Joseph knows that the child is not his. In a society where such a situation could bring disgrace or worse, Joseph decides to separate from Mary to protect her from the public shame and to do so quietly. Oftentimes we read over this passage and we don't understand why this is such a big deal. Like, it was just supposed to happen that way. See, in Jewish customs, there are, there are three stages to a wedding. Three stages. The first one is the engagement. Now, this was often taking place beforehand. The parents will come together. They may make an agreement to arrange this marriage. Or you can have a matchmaker put the couple together. But usually it was some sort of an agreement for some type of gain. But when, they, when the couple got old enough, they entered into what is called a betrothal statement. Think of this as a ratification of the engagement entered into by the parents or the matchmaker. At this point, ladies, at this point, the ladies, if they didn't believe that this should happen, they could call it off. I don't want to be married. But they had to do so before they entered into the betrothal contract. Because once you entered into this contract, it was binding. And society thought that you or thinks that you are married. You are husband and wife once you enter into the betrothal. And any promiscuous activity done outside at this time would have been seen as adultery. And this usually lasts about a year. And at the end of the year, they would have this wedding ceremony, the wedding proper. And this took place at the end of the betrothal year, and this was to combine them husband and wife. And it's within this year of the betrothal that Joseph is torn between two truths. I'm this woman's husband. I care for her. And she's having a baby that's not mine. So he comes to the logical conclusion that I think we all would come to. I'm going to divorce her quietly so not to bring public shame. I want to save her from public disgrace. I don't want you to miss out here. I want you to understand and hone into this. This decision that Joseph had to make because I think we fall prey to this every day. We find ourselves stuck between a rock and a hard place. And we try to make secret decisions to try to get out of them. 
so that we move in ways that we're not disgraced publicly. Joseph can teach us something here. Because God intervenes. The angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream, revealing that the child that Mary has was conceived by the Holy Spirit and would save his people from their sins. This revelation turns Joseph, Joseph's world upside down. He didn't know what to do. Why? Because in those times, only the Holy Spirit can change the heart of humanity. And as it is true back then, it is true today, whenever the Holy Spirit gets to moving, things are turned upside down. It calls for action. When the Holy Spirit starts to convict, you only have two options. You can move towards God or you can move away from God, but either way, there is movement. The Holy Spirit compels movement. Joseph's response is profound. It shows a profound act of faith and love. He chose to embrace Mary and the child, defying all social norms and personal expectation. This choice made by Joseph aligns him with God's redemptive plan and reflects God's will. Don't miss that. This choice by Joseph aligned him with God's redemptive plan and reflects a deep and selfless love. A love that puts God's will before our own desires, to put others before ourselves. In this time of preparation, we wait here for the birth of Jesus. Love incarnate. As John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. Nothing was made that has been made if it wasn't through him. And in him was life, and a life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Joseph's story, we see Advent, the advent of love in action. Love embodied by Jesus Christ. Love that is patient, that is kind, that endures all things. Joseph's love mirrors the love of God, the, the love that God has for each of us, love that is profound, so profound that he sent his only son to be our savior. So as I was preparing for this sermon in the wee hours of the night last night, um, I couldn't get away from the famously known scripture John 3.16. Admittedly, I try hard not to go to scriptural cliches, but this one had a hold of me. So I decided to read it to get it out of my system. But then I found something. As I was reading over it, I was reminded that we often stop with verse 16. Just John 3.16. And we forget that there is profound knowledge found in verses 17 and 18. Here's what it says, starting at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stand in condemnation already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. 
The belief in God is all you need to experience freedom. The freedom to choose to love one another. As we journey through Advent, we are reminded that love is often a choice. In our daily lives, we are constantly presented with opportunities to choose love over judgment, to have compassion over indifference, to have understanding in the midst of conflict. The choice of love isn't always easy, as we've seen in Joseph's story. It may lead us to unexpected challenges or preconcepts, and yet the choice to love as God loves is perhaps the most Christ-like decision we can make. So as we draw closer to Christmas tonight, let us reflect on the choice to love each day. May we choose to embody the love of Christ in our interactions, our decisions, our attitudes. Let the Advent love, the agape love, be more than a seasonal feeling. Let it be a guiding principle in our daily lives. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and for the example of faithful love shown by Joseph. Help us to choose love in our lives, reflecting the love that you have shown to us. As we prepare our hearts for Christmas, fill us with your love that we may share it with one another. It's in your name that we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen.